All right, people are people are trickling in here. So I will I'll kick everything off. If you haven't been to one of these shows before, welcome. I'm glad you could all make it. And for those of you that are joining us again, welcome back. Uh, this is a live episode of our podcast. Uh, this is CE Live. So before I introduce the people that you came here for, let me do a little spiel, a little bit of housekeeping. As you can tell, this is we've kind of set up like a Zoom meeting room. Um, reason being, I hate doing the webinars to the the faceless names in the crowd. So it's good to get to see everyone and feel like we're we're somewhat in person. We're pseudo in person. Um, second thing is again, we'll just repeat it over and over again and speak it into existence. This is not a webinar. This is not a webinar. This is a session that we want to answer any and all questions that you folks have. We've got a lot of stuff that we want to get into and cover, but as well, like the reason we're here is to answer the questions that you have. So, um, would love it if you could have your cameras on, if not, that's all good too. And if you have any questions during the session, drop them in the chat and then Ben, the brains of the operation, he's behind the scenes. He'll, he'll ping you to see if you're comfortable coming on camera, asking the question. If not, you can, we, we can just answer it too, uh, from the chat. Uh, yeah. And then last thing as well on the housekeeping side is yes, this will be recorded. So if you have to jump out 30 minutes in, that's okay. The recording will be sent to you on YouTube and on a podcast feed. Um, I'll only judge you a little bit if you dip out early. Um, yeah. How many, how many people we got trickling in here? 70, 80. Nice. We should probably just start to get into this before I start rambling. Um, who did you come here for? First off, I want to introduce our first guest. I'm joined by my friend and colleague, Brandon Bedford. Brandon is our competitive enablement manager at Clue. He's been running the compete program for five months or so now. And prior to that, he was uh, AE for 18 months or so. And I think he's going to win the award for most exotic location. He's actually just landed in Korea yesterday and is still, this is the commitment to the team. He's still doing the, the show with us today, jet lag and all. Brandon, I am so excited to have you join us. Thanks for the wonderful intro, Adam. Uh, glad to be here. Actually, the jet lag is helping me right now because I haven't fully adjusted. So 3 a.m. feels like nothing. <laughs> yeah, I mean... Maybe with this, like the, the plane brain, you're just, there's going to be some like insightful things that come out that you didn't even think yeah. you had locked up in That's that brain. Point. It might be like that, that Will Ferrell scene in old school during the debate. I mean, just like goes on <laughs> a full soliloquy and it's just, it's a plane brain. I know. I don't know where that one came from. Uh, ben, can you get Brandon up on camera? Can everyone see Brandon right now? I'm just seeing myself, which is, is dreadful. There yeah, we go. Yeah. Yeah. And now everyone can see the beautiful Zoom background as well that Brandon has, which is putting me to shame. Uh, all right. We also have a second guest. We are joined by one of my favorite people, period. And she also happens to be one of the sharpest people in competitive enablement. It's, of course, Clara Smith, the Senior Product Marketing Manager at Slack. Clara, thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure is all mine. Thank you so much, Adam and Brando for having me. A little bit about myself. My name is Clara Smith. I'm a senior product marketing manager focusing in on compete every day, all day at Slack. Been here for about a year and a half and come from about eight years of competitive intelligence and competitive enablement. I'm really passionate about putting insights into action and I'm just so thrilled to be here today. Like I said on LinkedIn in our corny clip, this is your show. This is not our show. Please, let's make this super valuable for everybody on the line. Um, and I'll get off my uh, my introduction high horse now and flip it back over to you, Adam. No, the more you talk and the less I talk, the better. I think the audience can agree with that. We don't poll people for that answer, Ben. Um, okay, so for this session, well, what we're getting into is really the reporting, measuring, and basically like proving out the competitive work that you're doing. And the reason I think Brandon and Clara joining us today is, is such a cool duo is that Brandon's been running a compete program for about five months. So in terms of when we, we have sort of a competitive enablement, like maturity model, like where you build your competitive program and sort of a roadmap on how to advance it. 
Uh, ben, you can drop the link to that maturity model in the comments too. And so Brandon's really in these earlier stages of maturity. So it's going to be interesting to get your perspective on what you're doing, kicking off competitive enablement and the things that you're reporting to that you're holding yourself accountable to prove the work you're doing. And then Clara, I'll, I'll gas you up a little bit. Um, I've seen some behind the scenes of what Clara is doing over there. And it's, it's pretty, it's pretty dang sophisticated what she's doing too. So we get, we get both sides of the, of the spectrum. Um, so yeah, I think this is gonna be really, really cool to have that. And in order to sort of best answer the questions that folks have, I wanted to drop a poll. Um, ben, can you drop that poll? I wanted to see like what level of experience people have in the world of compete right now. Uh, just so we can kind of tailor our responses, like some of the stuff that we, we tackle to that. Uh, all right, let me see, poll submitted. Well, I have to wait like 60 seconds, right? To get the responses here, Ben. I think, Adam, I tell mean, me you have some background music. Yeah, I know we need some elevator music, maybe some, well, I don't have nice any touch. jokes lined up yet. Um, I'm Jeopardy. Jeopardy final <laughs> question song. <laughs> I love it. Totally. We need the, the Slack huddle music when you're on huddle for a while. Great <laughs> yeah, for you know that one. It's a jam. Claire, did you, I, I, I shot you a message probably randomly on like a Friday night, Claire, like report to your CEO or head of product that I rec I am very, I'm a huge fan of the elevator music during the huddle when someone's totally like leaving me. All right, here we go. We've got responses. All right. 53% less than a year. Nice. We got about 11% at one to three year range, 9% three to five year range. And then we've got a quarter of people, five plus years. Okay, sweet. That is, um, that's a good mix. I think that was to be expected. So I think it's going to be some value across the board then. Um, should we kick this thing off? Should we get into this? I want to, I want to kick everything off here with, I want your immediate reaction to something Ben and Clara or Brandon and Clara. So I'm always going to slip on that one. Um, so I was looking through the data for our upcoming report, the state of competitive enablement that we made with our friends at the PMA uh, coming out May 20th. So put that on your calendars. But one of the stats that stood out to me was that 54% of folks running competitive programs aren't measuring their performance in any way. What, Brandon, Claire, what, what's your reaction to that? Is that a surprise? Like, give me your initial take to that. Shock and awe, right? I, I have no words, right? I think at the end of the day, we know that competitive enablement is this new up and coming category of putting insights into action. And it's not a shock that there's limited reporting around that. And it is a new art and a science. So we are figuring this out together. And that's why I'm so glad about the dedicated resources that Clue and the PMA have done to, to add some maturity around this. And this is a first stake in the ground. It's like, let's draw something in the stand together, right? And if we need to improve it, we can absolutely do that. Yeah, I'll, I, I totally mirror that. And I think, yeah, on one hand, like it's, it's shocking in that, you know, it, it's definitely deeply saddening to, to see that, you know, fellow compete practitioners not having those kind of compete metrics, but, but also not surprising in that the way that I think compete has done, which I'm sure we'll, we'll dive into more today, makes it really hard to measure uh, metrics. And there hasn't really been like a, a clear blueprint on this. Um, you know, the, the outcomes that we drive sometimes are harder to measure. And so I think hopefully we can uh, not just talk about the, the theories here, but we also share some like really actionable ways that we're each doing it. I know, Claire, just not, again, not to gas you up too much, but I know there's a lot of sophistication in the way that you measure success. Um, whereas Clue, obviously, you know, I, I love the juxtaposition you made, Adam. Like, I'm just kind of like on the ground floor building this based off of, you know, what we've seen with our clients that works. And um, we're kind of, converging on similar answers. So I think that's really, really cool. Totally. Um, with that said as well, yeah, we're going to get into the house and tactical things that you could take away today and start using to measure and report on your conveyor program. But I wanted to open with a little bit of story time, Clara, uh, because we talked about something offline and you, you mentioned to me, we were like, so why, like, we got to kind of kick off of like why reporting on your work matters. And you immediately started to tell me a, a story actually on Friday about your compete program was potentially in jeopardy. I mean, the realities of business sometimes. So do, do you want to share a little bit of that, um, yeah. that story? Because I think it's a great way to kind of set the table for this conversation. 
Absolutely. And I'm a storyteller, but I know each and every person on the line are their own storytellers in their own right. So please come up, um, bring your coffee, bring your tea and, and listen to my story by the fire here. So this was at the beginning of my CI career and I was at a company that I'm not going to name. And CI was uh, originally started within product, right? And um, it was funded really well. It, it hired me internally. I switched over from an enterprise dimension marketing role. And at that point, it, it actually had switched into a different organization. And that lead of that different organization um, was very questioning, questionable about the purpose and the, and the longevity of competitive intelligence. And so there was three times that my job in the program came up to the chopping block and said, we want to make you into a generic marketing associate or a generic PMM. And every time I got to keep my title as dedicated competitive intelligence analyst because of the reports that I pulled from Salesforce, because of the qualitative and quantitative approaches to collecting that intelligence and the rigor around doing something on a consistent basis. And it all started in a basic Excel sheet. It was not fancy. I had zero budget. If I could do it, anybody can do it. It was like my year two, three doing CI. So I was very much a newbie. And to some of the feedback and comments here, um, Alan, Ben, Scott, I think that you know, a lot of people on this line that the 20, 20 to 50 percent of the people who are brand new, um, this will seem like a lot. But all I have to say is just count your little victories, start like, you know, a small snowball, it will, it will grow. And for those who are at super mature organizations, let's pay it forward in the industry. Let's help people up um, and get their maturity so that they don't have to make the mistakes that we did. To that point, then starting the snowball, let's, let's get into what each of you, what you did, Clara, in those first couple of years to some of the like tangible things you were doing to yeah, keep your definitely. program alive. And let's Brandon talk. as well, yeah. yeah, we can dive into, let's, Claire, you, you tee it off first and then Brandon will okay. jump into sort of your, your project as well right now. Yeah, so there's a couple of ways that you can measure um, productivity, revenue impact, and, and strategic decision making. And I saw a comment in thread, I think it was by Alan, it really depends on who your stakeholders are. So if your stakeholders are sales, if they're marketing, if they're ELT, right, executive leadership team, their measurements of success are going to look different for each of those things. So if you know your stakeholders, then you will know your metrics. And fortunately on my end, I had stakeholders all across the company. So what success looked like for product was a, um, a quarterly briefing and a screenshot library that was constantly kept up to date. And then I kept all the positive emails that came back when I would support strategic one-off projects. When you look at sales, I had an entire DSR or deal sales request dashboard where I was actively involved in competitive deals and I could track the attribution and win-loss rate and most importantly, competitive pipe and competitive close once supported. And then lastly, with more strategic projects, you really want to live in the qualitative soft art type of perspective, which is like your NPS score, your satisfaction scores, um, and all that you can do with free tools and technology out there. So I just dropped a lot of gold right there. Brando, <laughs> what do you think? Yeah, no, I love that. And I think, you know, again, kind of converging on like a similar outcome. And I think about it a little bit differently, but I think it's, you know, a lot of the same metrics. Like I kind of think of it in three buckets. There's kind of productivity or output metrics, right? number of assets created, number of screenshots in your library, number of battle cards or competitors tracked, et cetera, to measure like, am I able to focus and actually create the output? Because especially at Clue, yeah, you know, we're a, we're a fast growing startup, but we're 200 employees, product marketing team of three. You know, I do get pulled in other directions. I have to help out with product launches, which I, I would imagine for anyone that's, you know, at a smaller company relatively, um, that's a very, uh, that's, a, that's a reality for you is that, you know, even even my role, competitive enablement manager, I, it's in the name and I'm focused on it. I still have a lot on my plate as a product marketer. So I think that's um, one piece I always like to look at the output. Am I delivering competitive content and insights? Then I look at qualitative and quantitative exactly the same way. It's so like qualitative, I think you hit on a bunch of them. One I just add there um, is like confidence, um, whether that's sales confidence, um, very helpful for seeing those leading indicators that come before revenue or competitive win rates or even pipeline, just to see, hey, how, how confident do our sellers feel um, when up against particular competitors? And is that uh, ticking up or down over time, hopefully up? And then the uh, quantitative side, I think you nailed as well. Uh, obviously, the things that are re relevant to or closer to revenue are going to be easier to measure. And uh, you know that's oftentimes, not all the time, but oftentimes why we recommend starting with sales first, because you can get some of those quantitative metrics that are, you know, 
quite honestly, harder to um, determine when you're enabling a product team or a marketing campaign or um, an executive team for that matter. And so, um, yeah, very similar, I think, outcomes. And I think just, I just bucket them slightly differently, but I think, yeah. Um, yeah. I love that, Brando, you added some uh, standardization to my chaos. Uh, there was a common thread that got me thinking around what is your SLA of responding to requests coming in? That's something that you could report on, right? Mm -hmm. So for example, if there's a big, big major market event, acquisition, funding, product launch, whatever, did you respond within 24 hours with a rapid type of analysis, right? Or did you just cover the news and that was within your SLA? So I do think that there's definitely SLA is service learning agreement. Basically your operating procedure of what you've confirmed to your stakeholders that you will deliver uh, in terms of the service and partnership. Totally. And um, actually we, we, already, we have Pierre who wants to jump in here. I, Pierre, I met Pierre at Intellicon and I told him he had to come on and ask a question. So look at that. <laughs> he's a keener. He's got his hand, he's got his hand raised as well on, on the, on the chat. So Pierre, you had a comment in relation to, to something that Clara said. Do you want to? Yeah. Yeah. First of all, yeah. I like, you know, already what you said, Clara, I just wanted to iterate on one of your first comments because you say, yeah, you know, the first thing is to define your, um, uh, criteria of success with your audience and completely agree with you <laughs> that's a lot of things I, I i i done the mistake of not doing in my first job as ci uh, the one thing i would tell you that when you do that when you meet with your stakeholders uh, uh, to define what success is going to look like uh, they're going to give you the criteria the, the, like you know we want to know how much you impact in revenue or how many other parts make sure that you set the expectations on the threshold for success if they tell you the metric is dollar amount to impact it make sure you know, you give them a number and you agree, both of, both of you agree on that number will be as successful or not. Because I got burned like that where, you know, I did like Clara said, you talk to your VP of sales or your VP of marketing, they tell you a metric. But then when you come back the next quarter with like your numbers, they're like, yeah, that's not as much as we want. And I'm like, but yeah. never they tell you like what's good enough for them. Absolutely. So yeah. The yeah. And revisit I love that, people. Pierre. Yeah, revisit it at a, at a very consistent basis and show the little victories. Don't just check in every quarter. Um, my last comment on this is it's the concept of agile CI, which is this new term that I'm just going to create on our not so webinar today, which is like, how do we update our stakeholders on the need to know insights at a very quick perspective? And I'm very lucky to use Slack for that, right? So you can absolutely measure that and keep them up to date and, and provide that agile pivoting approach. What love that you heard it here first, folks. Agile CI. <laughs> Thank you, Pierre. Uh, Claire, I actually you mentioned there, so it's kind of to Pierre's point, it's like meeting with those stakeholders and kind of setting the expectations early. But then you also mentioned like regular check-ins, like quick check-ins. It's not just a quarterly cadence. What does that look like to you? What have, what have you done before in terms of those check-ins? Is that yeah, Brando? I'm curious about you because you probably do it you know, at a quicker ramp than I do because of just mm -hmm, the, yeah. the size of Clue. I think for me personally, you know, Compete works very closely with our executive leadership team. So that's a, a monthly meeting, right? Monthly or every mm -hmm. other meeting where you can reset expectations within a Slack channel, even in between the meetings. Yeah. Um, same thing with sales leadership, same thing with win-loss readouts. It's it's the, the, co the common public speaking, which is tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them. <laughs> I love that. That's the, I never heard that one before, but it definitely applies to, uh, to compute work, that's for sure. Um, yeah, and when I think of kind of that agile CI concept, my mind went to actually a real event that actually I share. So um, this was like month two or three um, as I was in the new role. So this was very early on while we were building the program and I'd set up some metrics I cared about, but there was a real scenario where agile CI became really important, which was one of our competitors was acquired. And I'm sure anyone here that does, you know, runs a compete program for any length of time, that there are certain events that just are kind of a um, drop everything and, and focus on um, kind of event. And in that moment, it was really important to address it really quickly, but not to just blast out the event, right? People saw the press release. It was out in the wild. And there was actually a process that we went through that, you know, you know not to get into like the technology and how it's supported by Clue, but you know, when that happens, I need to immediately kind of triage the important stakeholders to kind of form an opinion. And, you know, I form my opinion being the kind of subject matter expert. I'm kind of in the weeds. So I said, hey, this is a competitor I got acquired. 
um, here's my take. And I shared this with the kind of people that were in the know that, that need to be there. And for us, that was the executive leadership team. For, for larger teams, that might be a segment, right? A certain product line or a certain team. But I shared that with the executive team and said, hey, this just happened. Here's the initial take. And would love to have your feedback. And I also set up a meeting that later that day, like end of day, optional. Our entire executive team ended up joining. I mean, we're clue. I was to care a lot about this stuff, but um, ended up joining and voicing their opinions and, and adding to that kind of draft that created. And then by end of day, I had a take that was approved by the executive team. And I had that queued up to go on our next Intel digest. And it was an emergency digest. I didn't wait till our usual Thursday. I sent it out the next morning. And so within 24 hours, I had a kind of approved response. And the reason I bring that up is because I think on one hand, you definitely want to be agile, but you don't just want to you know, reply willy nilly and just share the initial take because that can cause panic, right? People are going to ask questions. Mm -hmm. And so by kind of taking that time to uh, really get a sense of like, what's our take here? And, and of course, I just kind of skipped a step announcing to the org saying, hey, we know we're on it. We noticed that this happened. Stay tuned for kind of the, um, the why it matters, if you will. Um, yeah. I think that was a really important process that is, I'm sure it's relevant to other fields, but I think is, you know, again, in my you know, limited experience is, is very unique or at least very important to competitive enablement because these things happen. You can't control when some a major event happens, whether it's a product release or acquisition or uh, a company goes under, what, ha what have you. Um, so you want to strike that balance of quick response with like thoughtful and prepared response as well. hundred percent, Brandon. Um, uh, I was coached on this very early in my CI career with the, the model of a rapid response approach, right? Which is, you know, you let the company know that you're on it in the Slack channel. Hey, we're on this news. Please stay posted within 24 to 48 hours about our full analysis and the threat level that we should take this as. What does it mean to you? What does it mean to the market? What does it mean to our customers? And what does it mean to our product? very simple four prong template. And that usually quells any fear or hype, right? I mean, it's very important for people to crowdsource intelligence and insights and news to you, but you are that so what pillar that really cleans and measures and makes the, the response very intentional. Um, we had a recent experience at Slack where a certain competitor came out with a certain product Product and there was so much hype about it hmm. and everybody didn't know what to do about it and what that meant. And I created a positioning guide of what this meant in response. And I realized that I personally created a lot of hype out of it by actually giving it a dedicated deliverable. So you have to be careful about how much weight you mm -hmm. actually give to competitive events and what yeah. does it actually mean in terms of your pipe, right? And, and the competitive deals that are actually facing that event versus is it just marketing buzz? Yeah, that's a great point. That buzz between how much is actually affecting pipe is such a common, I like I've, that's come up many times when I've spoken to folks is uh, some, an event happens. And specifically if you have like a compete Slack channel, like raise your hand. If you've had like sales reps all filing in, everything's on fire, everything's on fire. And it's like, well, is this actually as big of a deal as we originally thought? Sometimes it might be, sometimes it might not be um, in terms of like, okay, Brandon, since this is something that you've just experienced first quarter on the job. You've mm. laid out some of these things that you're going to report to on the success of your program, say confidence. Right. Um, I know that you've done like competitive displacement, something that um, I think is another thing we could jump into. But as you mentioned there, you got to drop everything and do this, like this cover this acquisition piece. Now that might have taken you away from some of the things that you were had held um that you're going to be held accountable to on like a quarterly basis or on an annual basis. So how do you bake, uh, bake that into sort of reporting on your output or the work that you're doing right. when you covered, when you've spent X amount of days, X amount of hours, not doing what you originally scoped, but Hey, this is the job. You got to react to this. Yeah. I'll be honest. I, I don't have a great kind of scaled solution for this. Like it, it did happen. And I think actually this quarter, one thing that Jason Oakley are, are, uh, the head of our product marketing team implemented is like we are now tracking not just within our compete program but for our whole product marketing team uh, what we're calling wedges right things that we didn't predict were going to happen in the quarter but came up and were important priority and we had to do those things and uh, we just started doing it this quarter so we'll you know i'll report back uh, next quarter on like kind of how that uh, that goes but i think is an, what you're getting at here adam is really important is like you have kind of your list of things and everyone had hopefully has kind of a roadmap of all the great projects you want to get done, the competitors you want to track, the, the many, many myriad things that you want to uh, get done in a quarter. 
things do happen that come up, whether that's an external uh, event, like a competitor getting acquired or an internal one. Maybe there's a new product launch that happens and you need to drop everything. Um, it's, it's important to at least track that so that you can kind of reflect at the end of the quarter or the end of the period and say, okay, how much did we get done? And if it's not 100%, like, why is that? Was it because of these wedges that came in? And how much time, ideally, we want to know how much time do we have to spend on that? And what ended up getting dropped because of that? So again, work in progress, but I think that's one of the ways that you can do it. And I'd be curious if anyone else has, uh, has um, strategies for those kinds of ad hoc projects, which, you know, no one loves the ad hoc project, but oftentimes they happen and they're critical. Yeah, absolutely. I was recently working on one of those ad hoc projects that take about 60% of my day to day for the next couple of weeks. And this is a big fire that the company needs to be putting out versus the little fires that we can let burn. So this is an analogy that I shared with you, Adam, in our, in our rehearsal and brand no two, which is there's always fires in competitive intelligence and competitive enablement land because you are that, you know, that fire truck that comes in, you're the enabler of putting out the fire. So you are in this power of control to figure out which fire is burning the brightest and where is the greatest impact um, of resolution. So when it comes back to like metrics, I think it's so important to also make sure that your stakeholders understand the opportunity costs of you choosing fire mm -hmm. over a different fire, a bigger fire versus a smaller fire. Um, um, and that's more from a theoretical angle, but I've been able to quantify that at Slack by sharing, you know, if this priority is number one, these other priorities will be deprioritized and be very transparent with who's on my list um, so that your other stakeholders know what you've promised and committed to other people and they know the impact of their ask on your list. Totally. I love that. And I know, um, Adam, you might be getting this because I know there's people that have comments, but just on this point, I wanted to add something because I think this whole topic of measuring success and, and setting those metrics is doubly important because that helps the prioritization process. Like the mm -hmm. end is what justifies the means in that respect. And I think this is what you're getting at, Clara, which is, you know, by having, you know, good qualitative or quantitative data, whether that's win rate or revenue or sales confidence, what have you, that's what then allows you to go back and say to the sales rep that's asking for a battle card on competitor number 562 that, hey, actually, we don't lose any revenue to them. They've come up in three deals ever. And you know what? The sales team has never requested this before. And, and having that, again, it's not saying no, like we're going to add that to the list, but understanding where it is on that list and that, hey, there are these other fires uh, that need to be addressed. Um, again, not suggesting we just go and say no to these things, but it allows you to have that system to say, uh, to have a, a rationale and, and um, be able to scale for those important fires. 100%. Last thing I'll say, Adam, before kicking it back over to you, is that those competitors are actually better fit for product. I like to call them ankle biters or niche competitors because those biters, are the disruptors. Yeah. They mm -hmm. have not come across in any of your deals. Maybe they haven't hit the enterprise yet, but they are where product wants to know where the blind spots are. So keep a list of them. You say, thank you, sales. If there's a huge 500K deal, then I will prioritize it. But if you don't have that 500K deal piped, I'm going to pitch it over to product and maybe do some screenshot and product teardown analysis. I love that. It just actually speaks to last week. Um, we had the Salesforce team did a round table in telecom at Oakley. And one of the things that Dan Hamilton mentioned is that like, like prioritization, you don't want to just spread peanut butter and stretch yourself doing shallow work across the board. You want to be prioritized and letting everyone know where you're prioritizing your efforts uh, and I think it just speaks to both of the points you both made. Um, Alan actually has a comment and wants to come on screen in regards to sort of this like ad hoc, um, the ad hoc hey projects you're working on. Hey, Alan. Hi, uh, I'll just uh, give a little background on who I am and why I would uh, be fit to comment first. Um, ADSC is a marketing communications group from Toronto. We only deal with high tech companies. And what we do is we get them brokered introductions to uh, you know, uh, uh, decision makers with BANT, budget authority need timeframe. Now, part of what we do, we call it our ADSC Vortex services is not just that. We provide our ethical market intelligence services. So the way that we display our value is a little bit different than what you guys are talking about because we're going in the thin edge of the wedge, 10 minutes in front of the, the bleeding edge. And we see stuff that normal uh, sales personnel would never see, ever. We're talking to thousands of people. They're talking to very few. And we're taking that and we're escalating that uh, with the knowledge that we already have on products or services, core offers, whatnot. So when we see something, it's reported immediately. 
Uh, we have our own little matrix of maturity for how we do that. I'm not going to deal with that right now. It's not appropriate. But, you know, the bottom line is, is what we do is we escalate things based on real world rubber hits the road uh, events that are directly linked to new accounts that we've created with them. Mm -hmm. So because we've done that with them, they immediately see exactly what's going on. There is absolutely no problem with transparency. And um, we can escalate it by turning around afterwards, doing some research and saying, oh, by the way, the reason that they don't have any budget is because for 60 days is because they're being acquired. And we've talked to the people where their bosses, bosses, and now you're in there. That's what we do. So, so the issue is we're not just doing competitive intelligence. We're mixing that into the actual program to increase their market. So um, when you're really mixed in, and this doesn't have to be just in sales and marketing, it could be in executive enablement or other things, but when you're really mixed in and you have somebody at, at, at the front end that clearly has an understanding of what are the real issues that are going on, or they've been made aware of what are the real issues that are going on, that really helps. By the way, I teach my people memory techniques, and it's the only way I can get them to be able to figure all this stuff out. They need to be able to keep a lot of knowledge. Absolutely. Not joking. Absolutely. <laughs> totally. I appreciate the comment there, Alan. And, and I you. firstly, totally recognize the, the memory piece. It feels like sometimes I'm trying to do so many different things at once. Um, and right. maybe if I can attempt to connect this back to what Clara said, I love what you said right at the end there, Clara, around like, you know, if there's like a $500,000 deal, then no, that's a different story. And I think this, again, ties back to the topic of measuring success is Sometimes there are success metrics that don't scale. And, you know, I'll be honest, I know that saying is like really trite and it's like, you know, do the things that don't scale. I'll be honest, I never fully understood that saying until I, you know, got into this role, which is there are times when you need to help out, you know, in that one-on-one -on -one deal situation or hop, maybe hop onto a call with a prospect or a client. And again, no, not every compete, compete program is the same. So that might not apply to all of you, but oftentimes that doesn't scale. It's a lot of time off of your plate, but it can not only influence perhaps a $500,000 deal, but it's a real example of impact, right? Very similar to Claire, you mentioned earlier, like the personal anecdotes and the emails that you see, right? That, those are, you know, kind of one-off events, but they're, they're valuable in painting a broader picture of hey, here are the deals that I fully supported in and, you know, we clearly won that deal. So um, the things that don't scale often are the closest tied to reality, uh, I guess is the way I'd sum it up. Just one, one last comment from my side. I, to Clara, thank you so much. I love that idea of Agile CI because this is exactly what Brandon and I are both talking about. Wonderful. We appreciate you, Alan. Yeah, thank you so thank much. You. Um, to the point of, of scaling, um, my boss, uh, currently it's like he's come up with a term, nail it and then scale it, right? So it's like, how do we nail uh, something against a specific niche competitor and then scale it across that category of niche competitors, right? How do you work on one custom template for one deal um, that's worth 500K and then open it up as a template to everybody across the board and then measure download rates in high spot, right? So it really depends on what CMS you're using and where you're looking to scale it out to the field. Um, but I do think that nailing it is so important to validate your intel, to validate your approach, to validate your competitive narrative. Um, I do a lot of customer facing competitive intelligence, which I know is a lot for just the basic PMM out there. But for all the veterans out there, that's really my sweet spot in terms of validation and nailing and scaling assets to figure out if it's worth rolling it out to the field. This is a perfect example, by the way, Clara, of our difference in, in uh, perspective on the topic. Because I'm like, do things that don't scale. And you're like, you can scale the things that don't scale. And that's, that's like the next level, I think, of that. Like, totally, right? Like it's, yeah. you know, get, get a team that can... You know, that's trained on doing deal support, all of a sudden you, you now have able to scale it. So I, I just, you know, quick shout out to the, uh, the curators, the producers to put these, uh, I, God, it's a perfect example of two very different programs at two very different stages, but uh, hopefully providing insight to a lot of different teams out there. 100%, yeah. Uh, I want to, again, because I think we have so many folks as well in that early, early stages. I'd, I'd love to kind of do a little uh, capper here on, if you, Brennan, if you were talking to someone that's like is from ground zero right now, starting from scratch, what are like the two to three things that they should take away and immediately at least build their 
um, their program around or their efforts around? Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come in with a hot take here and I'm not gonna say two or three things. I'm gonna say one thing, okay, which is start with sales. Nice. Start with sales. And to be honest, there's multiple things embedded in that. And the reason I say that is because you're going to get the most measures out of starting with sales. You're gonna get closer to revenue so you'll have better quantitative metrics. There are clear outputs that I think, you know, that sales reps often are an engine and sourced for, right? They're sharing Intel with you. That improves the quality of your insights over time, but they're also the ones requesting content oftentimes. And so I, I just see, of course, I'm a little bit biased because that's what I did. And I, you know, I'm doing it, I'm starting with sales, but I, I, I'm I curious actually, if there's anyone else here that has a different take, but I, I think that by starting with sales, you get better success metrics and it creates this flywheel to help better prioritize your work. And from there, you know, it, you'll be in a much better spot to scale up the program. And maybe just last thing, I'll just okay. comment out of your Claire's point, but just to your point around like being able to show even at an early stage, like here's the impact that you're having. If you ever find yourself in that unfortunate situation, like helping sales, I think will put you in the right, in the best spot possible. Um, if your program is in the unfortunate spot of being in jeopardy. Claire, what's your 100%. take? Yeah, thank you, Adam, for the opportunity and Brando big heavy green checkbox emoji there on slack so uh let me just comment in the real world to that with a fake emoji but um yeah to, to answer your question adam i think sales is a great leading indicator place to live where you can respond to those fires that are attached to active revenue that could be on the line if you weren't supported right a previous like data scientist at a company that i worked for um had actually calculated when the competitive team supported a deal, what was that win rate and why it was 40% lower when the CI team was not involved. Now for every PMM out there, I know that that's like an ideal state situation, but even by picking the top three or four deals a quarter, hopping on an internal strategy call and saying, here's the latest battle card. These are the latest things from our last rapid response that I pushed out in market about this competitor. That's enough for you. And then you can track that deal and attribute revenue to close. Um, but I do see this is as a hub and spoke model where to the flywheel piece that Brando talked about, you have your stakeholders, which are the ring around, then you're at the center actually cleaning, digesting, packaging out intelligence to that right stakeholder. And each of those um, pieces of this flywheel has their own measurement and expectations. So it all starts on who are your early stakeholders? What are their expectations? How can you reset them based on your bandwidth as one single PMM out there? I know there's a lot of PMMs out there that do CI 20% of their, their job and I feel for you. And that's where automation and um, scaling out insights could really help there. So Clara, are you still doing tactical deal support then? right now? I have to stay honest somehow, Adam. And, well, the reason I kind of set you up there. Um, reason, reason I brought that up is this is a conversation that I've heard and there's sort of this dichotomy between like tactical, I think Pierre mentioned it, you start with sales, that's tactical intelligence. And he, he mentioned it as, a, as like bottom of the pyramid. Um, and then on the other side, you have sort of like the strategic use case or like this, you're, you're working with enterprise, you're informing the exec team on trends, M&A opportunities, that kind of piece. And I think one of the things that I think when I've heard talk to people that are at that end point where they have a seat at the table, it doesn't just happen by miracle. Like when we talk to, uh, a, again, Dan Hamilton at Salesforce, um, same same thing from folks at, at Dell. You you talk to folks in, at High Spies. We start with sales, and we get into we know what's happening on the ground, um, and being able to have that kind of presence and that understanding is what gets you to that point, which allows you to have your voice be heard and feel confident in what you're talking about. There, I mean, Jason Oakley had a post as well on LinkedIn, and I think Alex McDonald. I think I see you in the comments, but you you mentioned something, Alex, about like you need to be tactical and either in order to be strategic, like it's not one or the other. I think it like, it's like an evolution and they, and they go together. Yeah, uh, it is an a whole other thrown to me. I know, I know Clara <laughs> is, uh, Clara puts no, it better than, Oaks. Clara puts no, it better than it. I do. You, when we were chatting recently, Clara, you had a great way of wording it. Yeah, please go for it, Alex. It's all good. No, I mean, that's, that's exactly my point of view. It's like that, that, you know, who else would you rather invite to that strategic table for mm -hmm. the quarterly planning or the annual planning than that person who has been in there 
understands the dynamics of, of uh, you know, your competitive pressure really intimately. Of course, you can't get lost in it, right? Like you can't be the person who then goes into a tangent about the nuances and <laughs> idiosyncrasies of some deal. You then do have to be able to see the patterns. So that's where you could get, get tripped up. But if, if you can do both, if you can go from the tacticals to the strategic, the strategic point of view justified by all the detail you've been picking up through the tactical work, you're unstoppable. Yeah, absolutely. And like, I couldn't brief Stuart Butterfield on a consistent basis without saying that I'm in the trenches with his sales team and I'm working big deals that I can't even mention today. Right. Um, and then that also goes to win loss. I know that this topic is not about win loss, but win loss and deal support will get you back at that table every single month. Market analysis definitely plays a role, but it could be a little bit slower based on your industry. So the other two will guarantee you that seat and you can just roll up that seat at the table every single month. This Thank is, you, this Alex. Is why, this is my favorite. We just get Alex McDonald dropping in like that, just parachuting knowledge in, bombs. dropping some knowledge bombs. Like this is my favorite day of the month. So thank you all for being here with us. Um, and next, I guess, Claire, let's, let's kind of talk about that. Um, we've, a lot of this has been like early days. Where do you, where do you start? Um, some of the things you report on to begin with, but as you want to, um, as you get into that point of scaling uh, and you want to, you've, you've hit these kind of baseline pointers or checkpoints that, that Brandon mentioned, like what's the next couple of things as you're advancing the maturity of your program that you're looking at? Yeah. So I know that you have your own maturity model, Adam, that Clue has put out and I would, I suggest everybody take that maturity model and, and tag yourself to the level where you're at and where you want to go. I might actually flip this question on Brando. Brando, I would ask, where do you want to uplevel yourself? Because yeah. for me, I've hit a lot of the top level pieces, not firing perfectly on all cylinders. Um, but Brando, let's hear from you to really speak to the 50% of the people who are at that level one. Sure. No, I, I appreciate that. And I'm going to be fully transparent here because I don't think I have like a perfect answer. I'll be honest. Um, I started with sales and again, that was January 1st, right? And so then there's still so much to be done within sales, right? The, the rabbit hole keeps going deeper and deeper. But I think one of the, you know, it's a great problem to have, but now that I've proven out some impact with sales and I've built up that, um, that trust and the reputation, um, there's a lot more eyes on the competitive program and therefore a lot more requests. And I think someone in the uh, comments, so I'm just scrolling up to make sure I get the uh, get the name right. I think it was Melanie. Now, Melanie uh, mentioned, you know, customer success as a, uh, a great next step. And I, I actually really agree with that. I'd say if, if I had to pick one right now that I'm working on, it's customer success, partially because there's a lot of uh, synergy. I hate that word, but a lot of commonality with the way that I'm enabling sales. There's some slight tweaks to help uh, customer success and account management and uh, you know, expanding and growing accounts it has its own nuances, but it's also close to revenue and you're enabling customer facing teams. Again, you're building that kind of stakeholder alliances. So I guess the short answer to your question is I'm really thinking about customer success. And uh, I guess the, the caveat or disclaimer I provide is I know that doesn't apply to all organizations. You know, when I was on the sales side at Clue, I spoke with a lot of companies where their you know, next priority up was product and for good reason, right? They're in a much more mature industry. Um, there's a lot more players innovating a lot, a, a lot of really interesting things on the product side. And there's, there's more, um, vocal requests there. Whereas I think Clue, we're, it's not that we, you know, our product team doesn't care what our competitors are doing, but we're very much in the phase of let's create a category. Let's listen, you know, hundred percent to what customers are saying and what the market is saying and try less to uh, look at what competitors are doing. I um, mean, yeah. the customer obsessed competitor aware is kind of a, a saying I've heard a lot. Again, that doesn't apply to everyone. So again, your mileage may vary. I'm thinking a lot about customer success as that next step. And then the other angle that I look at it, which is kind of happening in in parallel, which is why I don't think this is a great answer. Like I'd love to say I'm just focused on customer success next, but the other is looking at those kind of ankle biters and some of those smaller competitors, right? In our space, there are a couple of name competitors that come up very often, but particularly, especially in enterprise, there are a lot of older school players that, you know, could be a $500,000 deal, really big deals with a very niche player. And so I'm kind of also juggling my, um, my time to think, okay, can I have some revenue impact if I do a kind of one-off project for this very niche competitor, but is in a very heavy compete deal cycle um, and could be, you know, six figures plus, um, like a really solid account. That's the kind of the side of desk thing that I'm also working on. Yeah, so that was a kind of long but just raw answer is, uh, is how I'm looking at it. I love at. that. 
No, I Claire, love that brand though. Drop what's the, your drop approach, Clara? To CS. So hard. Oh man, so my approach to CS. So I put it in chat, but I see sales equal the, the creation of any type of business, either retention, net new, or um, existing like cross sell type of business. So actually, in my world, I do 50 50. I do supportive customer success management and then prospecting new sales. That's me as like a, a competitive support geek. Um, but to actually a question that came up in chat from Pierre, it's like, you know, what sources of info do you use for win loss and how do you incent sources to give you useful data? I think it's just basic recognition, like throw them out in a Slack channel, um, put them up in the next big QBR meeting, um, give them as much kudos as possible. People just want to be seen and heard. And by giving them that credibility, it's really personal and letting them know that they were critical in terms of bringing that program or that initiative together. Um, I'm going to switch topics just to answer your question, Adam, around I got you there, um, which is, um, you know, what is what does that look like for me? And I honestly think about how can this one deal or this one initiative skyrocket me to four or five other stakeholders, right? So for example, I'll just pick a random logo out of the sky McDonald's. Like say if I was supporting a deal on McDonald's, how would my lessons and my pitch that I pitched to McDonald's could then be proved out in the next go to marketing campaign, could then be rolled up to an executive deck, could then become a win loss that I get insights from, right? So it's very much like I said, the nail and scale piece. But I think as PMMs, when we think about how we work with the rest of marketing, I don't see marketing as that first stakeholder. I see sales as that first stakeholder because marketing wants that sales win loss data. They want that rich deal support data. And so it's all about figuring out where can you build and who do you need to work with first for a solid foundation, right? Sales wants your market analysis and events understanding of what's going on in the market. Once you can nail that through a basic newsletter, then your maturity goes up to sales, et cetera, et cetera. It, um, Q in the clue framework. So I hope that helped Adam. Totally. And I mean, it almost feels like I mean, my content brain is like you're doing, you do this one piece of work and it can scale to different teams. It's sort of like repurposing, right? I think that's why Brandon's saying to someone at like an earlier stage of maturity, you go in sales and CS because there's already so much overlap that it's not, you having to make a whole net new amount of content uh, and analysis. It's sort of like, you just put a little bit of tweak and flavor and seasoning on that yeah. and it will support that CS side. Um, I want to I want to ask about competitive displacements because Brandon I know this is something that you've you've got in in sort of your oh, early yeah. days um, sort of I, I guess what would you call them, like your success metrics what you're reporting on is that something you is that is that just specific to you being at Clue or is that yeah. something you think other compete programs should be yeah reporting to as well Totally. No, it's, I, I, I'm glad you brought that up. Cause I almost, I totally blanked on that. That's a totally a big metric that I, I look at when it, when I look at revenue metrics. So just for, to get everyone up to speed, um, you know, Adam mentioned like competitive replacements. We kind of have a nickname called a rip and replace, um, you know, other, I know Oakley, um, at your prior companies, they, they call them switchers, I think, but it's basically a, a, um, a client that uses a competitive solution that switches to your solution. And I think this is a unique thing to track. You know, competitive win rate is great, right? When you win competitive deals. But when you can steal a client from another competitor, there's so many additional benefits to that. I mean, one, let's state the obvious, that's churn for them, right? Like that's, that's, a, huge, that's a huge win in terms of the negative for your competitor. Beyond that though, you can get so much great intel from those clients that were clearly unhappy with something, their pains were not being solved and they switched to your solution, right? A lot is said, and I don't mean to go too off topic here, but a lot is said about like secret shopping, right? It's a common question that, you know, uh, compete teams ask, especially when they're starting out. It's like, how can I get pricing information? How can I get product information from a, from a client? Um, you know, not even getting to like Skip's code of ethics around secret shopping and impersonation. Let's, let's even move that aside for a moment. Is that even valuable? If you had a full product demo of your competitor, would that be valuable? Or would you rather hear from a client that was unhappy, switch to your solution and can tell you exactly why they were unhappy and exactly why they switched? I see that as infinitely more valuable. And I think that's a really important metric. Thank you, Adam, for reminding me. Um, like that alone, I think if you had to pick one metric, I would pick that one um, as the one to track. Sorry, uh, mic drop. Ended. Now, I would challenge you, Brando. I'd say that's solid, super solid. Can't argue with any of that. But where's your white space? Your white space is in the win against column, right? So like, for example, 
if you're an up and coming uh, vendor in the tech world, what do you have? A couple thousand customers, maybe 20,000 customers, right? If you can rip off like a thousand customers from your competitor, that's awesome. But what about that white space where you get beat against, right? Beat against co mm. competitor X, Y, Z. It's a whole nother land there. And I would challenge sure. you like with Slack, we have a lot of competitors out there. Our biggest win against is actually email, right? Is displacing email, is Fair. ripping, replacing email. So that's my challenge. Uh, my humble, humble great, challenge to you, Brandon. It is a great point. And I know I, I love the I love the challenge. Someone need to, to humble me there. Um, but I think and, and to, I'm not even not even a but I and and because I think I agree with you. This is a Salesforce set I think I read way back in the day, which is like 74% of all I'm, I'm gonna butcher this, but something like 74% of all B2B deals are lost to the same competitor, and that's status quo, regardless mm. of what that is, if that's another solution or it's you know paper and pencil or Excel or email to your point. And so um, it's, and I think that's like a whole other topic for maybe in a future CE live is like his status quo of competitor, the status quo need a battle card, right? That gets into a whole other conversation, but it is a really, I love the way you think of it. That's the white space where there's potentially even more, um, more potential impact that your team can have, depending on kind of how you structure and how, I guess how you define what a, com a competitor is a uh, quick anecdote. And then I'll, I'll, I'll pass it back to you, Adam. Um, when we did our kind of survey, our confidence survey, and we asked sales reps, like, what are the three competitors, aside from our main ones that you'd want Intel on? A lot of them were crafty and said status quo. And so I think that's also indicative of, you know, there is that need for, um, you know, considering status quo or email or Excel as a competitor, quote unquote. That's such a good point. I mean, I like the way Alan put it, is like inertia is the worst competitor. And uh, I remember at Chair Summit before, I think Jacob on our team had Kevin Dorsey. So this is more of like the sales angle, but it was like, hey, if, if you're if you're talking to someone that's already using a competitor, that's great. That means they're already putting budget towards a problem that they want to solve. It's the folks that like, to Clara's point is like, it's the folks that are using email instead of Slack. There's the people that are still using Google Slides instead of updated battle cards in terms of clue like that's that's a whole nother kettle of fish and alex had a question on that on that piece like how do you get them past it? i mean we've got six minutes here i don't know if we can tackle the how you how you compete against status quo but alex i do think that that's a topic we're gonna have to tackle in the future too hey yeah, hundred percent, Adam. I know we have about five minutes left. Should we check in with the with with everybody on any open questions? Yeah, let let's me check in on the your non-webinar now. Let me do that, okay? <laughs> not a webinar. Again, I repeat, not a webinar. Yeah, if we anyone has any final questions that we can get to Brandon and Claire before the top of the hour, um, shoot them in. If not, um, that's all good too. I know we've had. The chat has been absolutely going off and it's gone in a ton of directions. Like I wanted to give a shout out to Zavo as well, who is uh, now a friend of the podcast too. We've met him in Telecom. Like I love his approach to this threat analysis. You're almost like quantifying the threat of your competitors. And I, I think that kind of dovetails as well into sort of a, a, a metric that you can report on. I, if, if no one, if no one else has a question, then I want to get your approach on that. Like, what if, if if either of you saw as I was talking about sort of like tearing your landscape is that something that you can report on to especially early days I guess like just to get a handle when you you don't even know what's yeah. out there or who you're competing against yeah you can tear out your competitors and then you can tear out your deliverables right so for all your tier one competitors which maybe are the biggest threat that have the biggest market share maybe the most competitive products out there. You wanna have a battle card, you wanna have an external one pager, you wanna have a couple of competitive case studies. Maybe you wanna have some SDR, BDR, quick hit response templates. Like what does that bill of materials look like for a tier one? And then your measurement is success, rollout, download rates, maybe uh, recommendations like NPS or whatever. And then tier two, maybe they just deserve a battle card. And then tier three, maybe they just like deserve a newsletter mention. So that would be kind of my final take on how to tier out not only your deliverables alongside you know the competitors and what that looks like from a framework perspective. Brandon, no, no, I think I think you nailed it. I think it's it's a really it's an interesting question because I think it it. I know it's not the topic necessarily of today's chat, but I think the metrics definitely inform prioritization and that that prioritization, I think is really important, you know, threat being one way to look at it. Um, and so, and maybe I'll, I'll keep my answer short because I just saw Zavin, uh, Zavin just added to the chat. Um, 
but I think being able to see, okay, this, this competitor is coming up. Let me just toss and again, not to plug clue, whatever software you use, I'm just going to toss that into clue to start tracking them because yeah, they're ankle biters now, but you don't know that's going to always be the case, right? You know, you know, every, I forget the, uh, the stat that, um, Hopi provide recently, oh, shoot, but it's like hundred percent of the companies that were in the fortune 100, I think it was like 50 years ago or something like that. Like basically the, the lesson is every company gets displaced by an up and coming competitor at some point. Right. And so being able to just monitor those small threats, even if, even if it doesn't take any of your time, you just, you know, stick clue on them to start tracking them. Um, I think that's really important. And then that gives me the peace of mind where I can actually focus on the ones that matter. So anyways, I'll just cut it short. Cause yeah. Um, so I don't, don't want to put you a, put you on the spot, but I, I was super curious about your threat model as well. If you want to share. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, it's, uh, it, it, like I said in the, like I said in the chat, it's, it's pretty crude and, um, I used it for a couple of different reasons to, um, uh, uh, one of them was to expose that our data needed to get better. So for example, when I, um, when I ran, when I did a first pass, it was the, um, the category. So it was, it was taking, it was just taking closed data from the uh, closed deals from, from Salesforce, who was the primary competitor. And then, uh, looking at deal frequency, deal size to essentially come up with what's the dollar value of a one, a 1% increase in win rate. Right, so um, just to come, you know, one-dimensional metric of who's the most important. Um, the top three by a factor of two or three was um, blank. I don't know, and they didn't say. Um, and so that is, uh, you know, so there's your argument for our data needs to get better. Uh, but then past that, there was a clear top five of, you know, here are the, you know, there was a clear top five of, and, and luckily for me, um, you know, I'm about six months into my current role. Uh, luckily for me, that clear top five that the data showed is the five that we care about that, you know, oh yeah, everybody knows who our top five competitors are. Well, yeah, and that the, the ones we think they are really are that, yeah. Um, but the interesting one is what, when, I, when I talked about the top five, um, number five and number six were actually awfully close. Like there's a very close six um, in terms of that number. And then that, that six are ahead by a factor of two or three over everybody else. But the reason I put the number five in the number five spot is because that close six was about the same as they were, it was about the same in 2021 as it was in 2020. The one I put in number five, their number in 2021 was six times what it was in 2020. Wow. Um, and so right. you, can start, you know, when you start looking at the Delta from year to year, um, quarter to quarter, depending on your sales frequency is a little bit, um, it's a little bit tougher, but, um, when I started, when, when I looked at the, um, when you look at that change, it's like, okay, these guys are a bit of an ankle biter, but oh my God, they are, yeah. they're coming on strong. We need to pay, pay really close attention to them and make sure they don't get any bigger. So 100%. Yeah. Adam, I think we found our, our next panelist for our next session. I know. I love Zabo <laughs> is awesome. Let me just put him out there. Yeah. It's uh, great. And actually uh, what's cool yeah. about What's cool about that, Zaro, thank you so much for sharing in the chat and in here. Like that, that's that's so awesome to get an insight into what you're doing. Um, the cool thing there is I think we originally like came to this topic is like reporting on your work, the output that you've done, like why you need to measure and report to prove the work you're doing. But like in Zavo's case as well, and like Brandon mentioned, you're reporting and measuring in order to prioritize what you're going to do and let everyone be informed of like again. Clara's point, I think we talked about this, is this is why we're prioritizing this. And it allows you to, yeah, have a firmer, not a firmer handle, but you have something backing you up as to why you're going to do this and how you're going to go about it. Um, and I think that's really important in this space today. Like this is a newer space. A lot of, um, like, I think like Clara mentioned, as people doing this for the first time, we've got 50% of people doing this for less than a year. And so I, these kind of opportunities to share what we're doing, is is invaluable like i mentioned it's my favorite day of the month claire and brandon we've gone over time here um thank you so much for joining me where can people reach you both brando you first yeah sure i'm um, quite simple on you know any of the the clue uh mediums of course but also linkedin uh, i try to uh share my my hot takes there uh feel free to connect and, and dm happy to chat Love it. Yeah, I'm also on LinkedIn, but you can find me on Slack Connect, which is how different Slack companies talk to each other. I threw my uh, email in there. Just throw that in your DM and happy to chat and level you up anytime and hope to learn from you as well. And thank you so much for your support and participation today, everybody. 
Thank you, everyone. This was awesome. And I hope everyone has a great rest of the day. Happy hump day, everyone. Bye, everybody. Talk soon. Thanks, everyone. See y'all.